The Old Testament account of Noah and the ark is probably one of the most familiar in the Bible. Children learn it and they love it and they do so at a very early age. But it is also a story that gives great insight into the nature and character of God. For when we see God's dealings with Noah, while you may find some other principles, there are at least four principles of God. Principles, that is, by which God deals with men of every generation. Now let's remind ourselves in the right division of the word that the first great religion was in the dispensation we call the father rule period of the patriarchal age lasting some 2,500 years going from Genesis 1-1 down to the giving of the law of Moses on Mount Sinai to the children of Israel in Exodus 19 and 20. Then there is the law of Moses period, the Mosaical age of about 1,500 years, ending at the cross, and then Christianity begins in Acts 2, and it goes on till the end of time. Christ has all authority in heaven and on earth during that last Christian dispensation, and he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through him, John 14, 6, today. Now you will find these principles of which I speak way back there in God dealing with Noah to be principles that he uses because he is God and all that that implies that he uses in dealing with man. You'll remember Genesis 6, 1 through 9 through 22 and that's the whole account of the matter pertaining to the destruction of the world by water. People were so evil the scripture says the imaginations of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man from the face of the earth. Chapter 6, verses 5 and 7. Now recently on Wednesday night, the idea of, of God repenting was discussed, well discussed, but I want to mention it here because we've used this passage God doesn't repent like we repent because God doesn't sin. It just simply means God is the same, but when men act evilly, that draws from him punishment. When they act good, right, righteously, then he blesses them. And that's exactly what's being said here. You read Romans 1, man departed from God because he did not like to retain God in his knowledge, and that changed God from the standpoint of the way we look at things, and the how he dealt with man. And here the Spirit through Moses, as he records this in Genesis about Noah and the flood, makes it very clear that God has a different disposition toward these people whose minds are only on evil continually. He's not going to bless them, though he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. But we see that Noah, out of all of that crowd of people, found favor or grace in God's sight. And because of that, God decided to save Noah from the flood. Before bringing a flood upon the world to destroy men, God gave directions to Noah to build an ark. Now mind you, the best we can tell, no one had ever seen any rain. And what's about to take place would not be today described really as rain. The windows of heaven were opened, and the fountains of the deep were opened, and everything altered and was altered by the great water that fell from the sky. You might want to look sometimes at what scientists have determined even today if all of a sudden, in a split second, the water vapor that covers this earth would all of a sudden fall on this earth. It would be a great deluge, and yet it was a different situation in those days because the world was not as it is today. 
But he told Noah, I'm going to save you because I favor you. Noah was unlike the rest of the people. He was still living as God wanted men to live in that far off patriarchal age. So we see that Noah had faith. Hebrews 11 makes it very clear that Noah was moved by faith. Well, that means he heard the will of God, and we know that will of God for him to be delivered from the flood was the plan of salvation of his day. He was told to build an ark of gopher wood. He was to pitch it within and without, which is tar. And it was to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. There was to be one window and one door and three floors. Now you can see there are the obligatory matters specified. And he had to abide by them. Now there's a lot of options he could have used in the process of discharging his obligations. I don't know what kind of hammers he had at that time. But that would have been an option in using. I don't know how he did a lot of things or who all was involved. But he could not deviate from the obligations God laid on him or it would not have been by faith. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's taking God to his word, Romans 10, 17. And when I get to Genesis 6, 22, the scripture plainly says, Thus did God according to all that uh, God commanded him, so did he. So he kept God's will. It also lets us know that grace through an obedient faith saved him in that long ago age. So the promise was given. And when Noah did what God told him to do, he would be saved from the flood. Now, let's keep all of that in mind. I want us to notice the first great principle that we may forget, even we who are members of the Lord's blood-bought body, the church. And that is that sin, man's sins, and he's put on our level of understanding, grieves God. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 teaches us that God created man in his own image. And that man would pervert the purpose and the plan God had for him. And all of that caused God to be grieved at his heart, Genesis 6.6. 6. There's something that enlightens us here, something that we need to understand, that the nature of God is to hate sin. Now, we who have heard the gospel, which is God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1.16, have complied with the mandates of Prince Emmanuel in obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ, completing that obedience and being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, thereby being added to the church by the Lord, Acts 2.38, Acts 2.47. We need to understand that we're to form the same view of sin beginning in our own lives that God has of sin. And sin is the transgression of the law, John tells us in 1 John 3 and verse 4. I cannot conceive of someone saying, oh, I love God with all that I am and all that I have. I'm so thankful that he did for me what I never could do for myself. I'm so thankful he supplied a way for me to be saved. And I've obeyed the gospel and believing in him, repenting of my sins and confessing my faith in him and being baptized to Christ for the remission of sins. And then just to cruise through whatever time you have on this earth left doing just as you play, please and not concerned at all about what God wants you to do as a member of his son's church. So we sometimes pass lightly over sins. And certainly the world does. And the denominational world, in one way or the other, human religions have made sin not that big a deal. So we must learn to see the importance of them by looking at how God thinks about them, not how you do or how some of my brethren or any other human being does. 
When God looked down on the world and saw that the earth was filled with violence, it says that all flesh had corrupted his way on the earth. Wickedness was great in the earth. Genesis 6, verse 5, and verses 11 and 12. It grieved God. Now, the Bible is an accommodating book. The Bible accommodates us as God made us. It helps us to understand. God is not grieved like we grieve at times in the loss of a dear loved one or a close friend or something of that nature. But it's trying to say so we can understand that God is sorely upset with us and our sins. When Adam and Eve sinned in Eden, the scripture teaches us that God drove them out of the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3, 22 through 24. Now that tells me a lot about God. He's not going to abide where sin is. And He's not going to allow sin to be where He is. The great messianic prophet Isaiah had this to say in Isaiah chapter 59 in verse 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. That's a potent bit of scripture. And why does God turn his ear away when we sin? Well, that's answered by the Scripture too. Listen to what he said by the psalmist. Thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness. Neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Psalm 5, 4 through 5. But again the psalmist says in chapter 45, verse 7, Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. And in Psalm 119, verse 128, I hate every false way. Now we have this silly view that's existed among a lot of folks who claim Christ as Savior, that you just can't hate anybody. I read of a girl in a Bible class who asked a Bible class teacher, is it wrong to hate the devil? And the reason she asked that is because of a twisted teaching on love everybody and everything. So I ask you, should those who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, by obedience to the gospel, should they love the devil? That is, if anybody knows the Bible, truly knows the right divided word. That is such an asinine question. But it comes from this false view of love. That you love everybody, everything, and so forth and whatnot. You don't love the devil. You hate the devil. And you hate everything the devil brings out. That's why we who have been redeemed from our sins by our love and obedience to the truth want to see people in sin and thus enslaved to the devil hear the truth and come out of it. Because they cannot, at the end of time, the destruction of this present system of things, enter into the presence of God. That's why we have taught so well that those on the left hand representing all the people of the earth accountable to God who are lost, that the Lord Himself, the Savior, says to these He would save, but they would not. Depart from me, I never knew you, and to everlasting fires prepared for the devil and his angels. If you go on through the Old Testament, you find that the wickedness of Sodom grieved God. And his love for sinners, while of course hating their sins, caused him to agree with Abraham to spare the city if, it was a big if, if even ten righteous souls could be found. In the case of you aren't that familiar with the Bible, Ken sometimes says, are there just ten righteous? And I wonder, well, do we know what he's referring to? 
He's being Abraham there trying to say, if you can find ten righteous people in Sodom, will you save them and not destroy them? And God said he would, but he could not. Genesis 18 and 19. So the fire from God filled to consume Sodom, and it paints a tragic and vivid picture of God's hatred for sin. All of that there way back in the days of patriarchy, long before Israel was a nation of the commandments of Moses governed them long before the church was established. All of that teaching us causing us to say God doesn't change. God doesn't change at all. The apostle John later writes God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not the truth, 1 John 1, 5 through 6. I remind you that's written to people who are Christians, not those outside of Christ. So there's always that need to remind the church you're not of the world. You're not to think like the world. You don't make your plans like the world does. You don't even begin to purpose like the world does. And we should be thinking of all the things that says this world is not our home. We're just passing through. For his creatures to walk in the darkness of sin, and that's what he means, grieves the God of heaven today as much as it did back there in patriarchy. Another important point that comes out of this is that God's patience is limited. People act like God will just always put up with the sins of men. They really think of God as some doting father with Alzheimer's. But that's just wrong. Did you ever wonder how long it took Noah to build the ark? Possibly a hundred years. If you look at Genesis 5.32 and chapter 7 to 11. But I have to read some more in the scriptures. What was Noah doing besides building this ark? Making sure he discharged this obligation given to him by the grace of God. Living by faith. Well, if you read 2 Peter 2.5, again written to Christians in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit had Peter reach way back over here to those days in patriarchy. Reminding us of what? Paul had to say that these things are written before time for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And it says that Noah, Peter did, was a preacher of righteousness. Well, we know he didn't just preach one thing and live like the rest of the world, but he preached the way he lived. Now David says in Psalm 119, verse 172, that my tongue shall speak thy word. For all thy commandments are righteousness. So if he were a preacher of righteousness, he was a preacher of the commandments of God. And as the years rolled by, Noah preached the truth and lived the truth while the ark was being prepared. The Spirit, if you please, of Christ through Noah spoke to that rebellious generation according to Peter in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 21. Now notice that God did not immediately destroy those who sinned. You can always be sure that God is going to give the exact amount of time to people in sin for them to repent of it and come out of it, for them to learn the truth. I hear people sometimes say, well, what about these people who never heard of the God of the Bible or Christ or even know of the Bible? It's not unfair to them to say that they're lost. We forget. Oh, how easily we forget. But it's brought back to our minds if we'll just read Romans 1 and believe it, that at one time everybody on this earth believed in God. Let that sink in. But men in time desired not to retain God in their knowledge, and they departed from God. God is not held responsible for men who he created with free moral agency for knowing him and then desiring to give him up. 
all are in sin. Christ said plainly that he came to seek and save that which is lost. They were lost before he got here. They were lost because they chose generations ago to depart from God. And sin was in the world because men chose to live contrary to God's will. They didn't want to think about Him. And you see it even today. Try to talk with many people about God and you'll have the door slammed in your face more ways than one. They don't want to entertain the idea that I must stand before God someday to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. They don't want to be accountable to anybody. But he gave these people ample time. He gave them warning after warning to repent. He did the same thing when it comes to Sodom and Gomorrah and the city of the plains in the days of Abraham and Lot. And he did the same thing to the cities of uh, uh, the children uh, of the Canaanite people who populated Canaan before the children of Israel came in. He just used Israel to destroy them off the land. God always gives more time than any one of us probably would for people to change. And Peter said that God is not slack concerning His promise. That is the second coming of Christ. But He's long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, 2 Peter 3, 9. So just keep that in mind when time ticks off your watch or you look at the clock. Each day that goes by, it's all God's love and long-suffering, giving people time to repent. So we must understand that God's patience is there, but it is limited. He'll not always allow wickedness to continue, but He will in time inflict punishment, eternal extreme punishment on those who die guilty of sin. You'll remember that in studying your Old Testament that many times in the wanderings of Israel under the leadership of Moses, in fact, they were wandering in the first place because they wouldn't rise up and do as God said and possess the land of Canaan, that they, even in those wanderings, continued from time to time to sin against God. But He kept them. He provided for them. He led them. Until finally they went, you might say, too far. And you read in Numbers 13 that punishment came upon them. Listen to what you have. Numbers 14, 27 through 31. How long, God speaking to Israel, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? And you come down... Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. But your little ones, which you said would be a prey, them will I bring in. And they shall know the land which you despised. Now we know from the totality of the information of the wanderings of Israel and their possession of the land of Canaan, that of all those multiplied thousands, well over a million people, 20 years old and upward, they all died in the wilderness, except for Joshua and Caleb. So it's amazing how people will operate. And we have all of that. We read it. We say, that's the Word of God. It's guaranteed. That actually happened. And it teaches us great lessons. But do we forget sometimes? These eternal, or this eternal principle as well as the others, of course. Because it comes from God, who's eternal, is at work today. I've already mentioned to you, 2 Peter 3, 9, why does God not send His Son back right now? He wants to give time for people to repent. He loves people. You say, why does He do that? Look, He made you a free moral agent. You have the power to choose. He appeals to you through His reasoning with the gospel. And He shows you all around you nothing lasts on this earth. Nothing. And we don't know when it's going to end. The Lord is patient. But one day, the patience will end and judgment will begin. Even as it did in Noah's day. 
Then this other principle, the third one comes up. And you notice we've known these all along. God wants man to obey him. Now, God's purpose for man is unchanging. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. I think I mentioned many times that duty is not in the original Hebrew. It just means the W-H-O-L-E, the whole of man is to obey God. Everything there is about you and that you are is to be given over to obedience to God. And why wouldn't a person redeemed by the grace of God want to do everything just as God wants it done? When God told Noah that he was bringing a flood upon the earth, <clears throat> I've tried to imagine, <clears throat> and I can't, but I try, the outlook and viewpoint and attitude of Noah's contemporaries. Well, they had to scoff at him, make light of him, call him no telling what kind of Bible thumper is in their day and time. But Noah didn't scoff. I mentioned this earlier, but I'll read it now in Hebrews eleven seven. By faith, Noah being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear prepared an ark to the saving of his house, Hebrews eleven seven. Now, mind you, the favor of God that he didn't deserve decided to save him, that is, God did through his grace, Genesis 6, 8. Yet he authored a plan that, man, that him being a free moral agent had to learn and live out in his life in building the ark according to God's directions. And the faith that he has or that he had while he was on the earth led him to keep the commandments of God. And he moved with fear, a proper awe and respect of God, which means he had the same attitude toward God's Word. And he prepared an ark. There's something we must do in accepting what God's done for us we couldn't do for ourselves. That's why he made us free moral agents. He wants us out of our own free will to choose to recognize these things and obey him. Noah believed what God spoke to him. Therefore, Noah did what God said. It's that simple. It still is. In Genesis 6, 22, here's the reading. Thus did Noah. Third time I think I've said this. According to all that God commanded him, so did he. Your tombstone. Thus did put your name there. Did you. According to all God commanded him, so did he. Would you oppose that being written on your tombstone? I certainly wouldn't. We're saved by grace through an obedient faith in this Christian age. Even as Noah was saved by grace through an obedient faith. When God said go for wood, God didn't mean you substitute pine or ash, whatever else they had. And I really don't want to go for wood was. Scholars think it's something like cypress. But who knows? He did. He knew exactly what it was. God didn't just give him general authority. He said, I want this kind of wood used. And here's the name of it, and you know what it is. When he said 300 cubits long, he didn't mean 301 cubit long. He didn't mean 299 cubits long. Somebody not really believing in the pattern of truth that is the infallible New Testament back when I was in school wrote the 301 cubit length arc, making light of the fact that you must do just exactly what God said that it would have been all right if he went one inch, we would say, or one cubit further. That is so ridiculous. If you can go one foot further or one cubit further or one inch further, why well, say 300 cubits in the first place? Why not go 350? Or why not go 295? See, all these things test our trust in God and His Word. Somebody asked me, 
why are you, if I were no one, why are you building this ark just 300 cubic feet long? The easy answer is God told me to. That's so simple. God told me to. And he did. So he didn't decide on 320 cubits or 280 cubits, and that would be better because it suited him. God told another man once to do something, a fellow by the name of King Saul, go to utterly destroy the Amalekites. None of them. We'll leave any of them. Well, he goes and he decides that he'll keep the best and bring back old King Agag, and he'll offer that. And he tried to blame the people. Well, he was a sovereign king. They do what he tells them. And because of that, God through Samuel let him know you had it as far as king is concerned. I've always thought about the way the scripture describes poor old Agag as Gag, he's standing over here listening to all this stuff. He thinks he's escaped. And Samuel doesn't just take a sword and whack him and top the head. The Bible says Samuel hewed him in pieces. I don't know what some of these people would think today when it comes to Samuel acting out of love. Well, I believe he acted out of love. Love for God and doing what God told him to do. Just like David did when he took on Goliath. You see, anytime we start thinking, if you don't watch out, we'll say, oh, I just, that's just horrible to me. Well, God did it. Look what he allowed his son to go through to save you. In me from our sin. That seems pretty horrible to me. But he did it because he loved us. Now that's real love. It just shows us we mess up on our definition of love so many times. And we learn from 1 Samuel 5.22, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. If we would please God, it must be on His terms and not our terms and therein is the problem men have faced for I don't know how long Peter writes in 1 Peter 1 seeing you purified your souls and your obedience to the truth then in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9 we're told that he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him and Jesus then asked in his earthly ministry in Luke 6 46 why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? The Lord expects us to obey, even as he expected Noah to obey. And, though he disobeyed, as he expected King Saul to obey. Then the last point is that God rewards those who obey him. It's always been that way. Patriarchal age, Mosaical age. God rewards those who love and obey Him. Without faith, it is impossible, underscore the word impossible, impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. And then immediately it says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Yes, we must believe that God is and believe that God rewards them that truly with all the power they have seek Him. Well, what was Noah doing in the building of the ark? Well, he's seeking after God, seeking to please Him, seeking to comply with His Savior's wishes. When one today is doing God's will, he's seeking after God and God's ways. Acts 17, verse 27. One who refuses to do the will of God can say he believes in God. All he wants to say, but he really doesn't. Not the belief that, he say, that saves him. Not the belief that moved Noah. Noah was seeking the reward God had promised. And he knew that it could only be had by his close obedience to God's instructions. So he did what God told him to do. Jesus warns us to enter in at the narrow gate. Then he says, For narrow is the gate, and straightened is the way that leadeth unto life, 
and few there be that find it, Matthew 7, 13 through 14. And later in that same chapter, he said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. It's so easy to say, Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, the only Savior of the world. It's another thing to take him at his word and always obey him. For those who do not obey, Paul's very clear. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 8. Now these eternal principles as the way God deals with sinful man have not changed. How he wants us to live our lives on earth in getting ready for eternity. See, God's in eternity, and he sees what time and material things are. They're just passing. They'll be gone before you can blink an eye. And everything that he has us do is to prepare for where we will be forever and ever with no end to those evers. And he asks us simply to take him at his word. Faithfully trust him in obedience to the truth. If you need to obey the gospel, would you do that this morning? If you've wandered from the Lord by sin, will you repent of those sins and confess them as a child of God? Pray to God for forgiveness. We'll pray with you and for you. And that wonderful God stands ready to forgive. So if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.